All right, Don, how are you doing? Hey, not bad, Danny. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I appreciate you joining me on the show. This is, uh, this is Don's first time being interviewed for a podcast, but he's been a real estate investor for a while. I'll, uh, I want to start with that. What, how did you get interested in uh, real estate investing and, and how did you get your start? Sure. Uh, mine's, I have nothing real unique about my story, nothing uh, cool like some of the other folks I've heard, but you know, it was back in 2015, I was looking for work at home type things to do. Uh, because I was, you know, I've been, I've been in corporate America for 20 years and uh, just trying to find an alternative, something different, something new, something that was where I had the control, where I had uh, control of my own destiny. Uh, and that led to real estate investing. And, you know, we, my wife and I got into this together. So the two of us did that. We started our first endeavor in 2016. And that was, uh, we basically financed a flip for that one. And said, okay, you know, we, we were able to watch it a little bit from the outside, see what was involved. And then we took the next step where we then uh, did our own deal. And from there started building, you know, continuing to do flips. My wife went ahead and got her realtor license and then um, did flips, built out our rental portfolio, and just kind of gained traction from there. Uh, and then about a year ago, uh, my, well, my now partners and I kind of got together and uh, my wife wanted to step back a little bit because not only was she doing the, she was helping manage the flips, she was helping acquire the properties and then uh, also doing a lot of retail sales because in the process of getting her license, she got involved in that aspect mm -hmm. of it too. So in order to control her time, then I started stepping in more on that end and we allowed her to step back by partnering with two others. So now, now I'm part of 3D Property Solutions and it's uh, myself and my two partners, Dave and Dean, and combined, they've got over 30 years of retail experience plus investing. So then, again, the three of us came together using their background plus my background in corporate America. I'm, I'm sort of the stick in the mud, right? I do all the back end stuff <laughs> and try to keep from uh, implying too much process because, again, I always wanted that control. I wanted that, that uh, freedom. And uh, I don't want to bring corporate America into our little world. But at the same time, there's a lot of, a lot of lessons there that, that we leverage and we can actually use to be very effective. So. That's kind of how I got started and where I am today. Cool. Uh, so uh, I'm going to come back to your part of the partnership and what you're doing, because I can tell that's the thing that, that you just like a lot and love doing. Um, so I want to find out about that. What kinds of things have you brought in? But first, let's go back to, you know, what was it that you were looking for a stay at home, work at home kind of thing? So did you did you watch some TV shows and saw a flip? How did you come into the whole real estate investing or house flipping part of it? Well, you know, it was. I'm not the guy for some reason. I know video converts, right? And, and we when you talk about lead generation and stuff like that, video seems to be the thing to do. But I've never been much of a video guy, so I was I was reading, right? That was it was me. It was Google. It was reading articles. It was trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and then I jumped into starting to listen to audiobooks as well, and that started the gears turning also. Um, so, you know, it was one of those things where you start to see different, you know, my wife and I looked at franchising, you know, opening a Chick-fil-A or something like that. We, you know, we explored a lot of different options where we would be sitting at the top of the chain and then figuring out how to go from there. But uh, a lot of those things that, you know, I use Chick-fil-A as an example, you're, you're really, I mean, while it's a good career, while it's a good uh, opportunity for a lot of people, that wasn't for us because there was, you know, there's limits on it or you're buying yourself a job kind of a thing. And we wanted a situation where we could get into something, build it out. And, and for me, I always like the idea of building the machine, right? So build the machine, get something in place, and then figure out how you can slowly step back. And I don't ever see myself stepping out entirely, but mm -hmm. I do want to have the ability to step back, watch the machine, do what it's going to do, and then be able to continue to tweak and improve. And then you know, as other opportunities present themselves, have the ability to step into them. Because right now, if we, I, I don't have the ability to step out and I don't have the ability to step into something new without making major adjustments. So, you know, that's where, that, that's kind of how I got there. So again, Google articles, trying to figure out what was out there, what opportunities were available. And this one seemed like the right one from two things. One, we, we liked the idea. We liked real estate. We believed in it as a, uh, you know, your money's backed by an asset. So, you know, I want to say safe investment because we saw what happened in 08 and we know the markets are cyclical, but it's a tangible asset. Whereas a lot of other things, if you're trying to do things, it's, it may not be tangible or it may not be uh, uh, something that you can control. So. Right. 
Yeah, it's pretty unlikely that all the money sunk into a house is going to disappear. Right, right. That's you what know, you hope, right? There's some kind of value to it, you know, unless you yeah. don't have insurance. And, but even then, you still have land. <laughs> but Yeah, no, that's true. I did find out one of our recent flips, we we didn't get insurance until, you know, a month or two into it just because mm -hmm. we were – uh, it, nothing happened. It was fine, but it was one of those, you know, eye openers that that was, a, you know, you find those little bits in your process that are missing. So I've since added that little checkbox insurance, <laughs> you know, <laughs> plain and simple, right? <laughs> yeah. That's the one you don't want to be caught not having. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Especially if you have, you have a loan too, and you got to pay that back with no asset, to, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And typically they'll make sure the lenders, if they're decent at protecting their money, they're going to make sure that you have insurance on it. Um, yeah, that's that's great, and I think uh, I love how you were were looking for something that played to your strength and what you want to do, not just the business of real estate, but being able to build up a machine and having that, you know, industry or that that uh, investment vehicle that you could build a machine around to do, and you could do what you like to do, and and uh, so let's just get into that. Like whenever you set out to start doing that and, and putting things together. Uh, with your wife and yourself, you know, what kinds of things were you working on to, to build that machine out of? So I relied heavily on, um, let's see, so I have a software development background. So for me, it was real difficult to, well, not real difficult, but I tried to be very conscious of not jumping too deep into the, uh, you know, I'm going to just go build it all myself. So mm -hmm. I tried to use uh, tools that were available, right? So the first system we ever plugged into was uh, Podio to help manage our leads. And then the first, uh, our first website, which we still have today, uh, was built on Lead Propeller. And so, you know, your company has been instrumental in getting us to where we are from that perspective. Uh, but it was cool because I could take Lead Propeller and that, and I actually got another, uh, tool that added on top of Podio. So everything started to plug together. And what I really started getting excited about was when we could start to automate a lot of these things. So when a phone call would come in, it would go, you know, we use CallRail. Again, there's another system that we plugged into to have our multiple phone numbers. So then every, uh, every different marketing campaign we had was a different, uh, different phone number. And then that way, once it would come in and drop into Podio and there's your lead, and then you're able to track it, create yourself tasks. If a website lead came in, from the website that popped into Podio, uh, you know, you start getting the text message when that pops up, you automate the email responses. Um, so those were, it was CallRail, Podio, and Lead Propeller were the first three tools that we used. And we stuck with those when it was just my wife and me, we stuck with those. Uh, that was pretty much it. And, uh, but again, that's, that's where I start to get excited. Like I said, about the backend stuff. And then now with 3D Property Solutions, I'm, integrating a bunch of other tools because we're expanding our partnerships as well right with three owners we have to take a little bit of a different approach it's, you know we you're not um i mean you're one third as profitable right as you would be in a one-man show so to do that we have to leverage the fact that there's three of us and really try to blossom the um the, the revenue from there so you know we expand partnerships we've got jv agreements and now it's a matter of taking our site and we actually use um, Flippilot again, another one of uh, your software tools there, Danny. So again, very excited about that stuff. So I'm able to now integrate that with everything. So I use Podio. We have a joint venture agreement with somebody who does um, lead generation on their end and they're in, in, uh, excited about the business and they're getting started. And then we do it. We have a partnership there. So they, their leads go into a Podio site that I've created, which is now integrated to Flippilot. The website does the same thing. Uh, you know, I can go on and on about all the different systems and tools, but uh, you can tell this is where I get really kind of turned around here. <laughs> no, that's good. That's what I want. Like, so it's, it's uh, because I think there's, there's, there's plenty of people still out there that, that are, are, are using notebooks and, and spreadsheets and, and not really working that part of the machine aspect of this business and, and uh, you know, having a way to know what's come in and what's being worked, what needs to be followed up upon. I think can be a daunting task for somebody that hasn't set anything up and has heard about all the Podio stuff. And then just like, you know, going to look at the site, you know, looking at Podio, checking it out and saying, Oh man, this mm -hmm. like, I don't know how I'm going to, it's going to take forever for right. me to figure out what I'm supposed to do here, let alone make it help me in my business. And, um, and so talking through the higher level aspect of it though, what are we trying to accomplish 
Like, what are you trying to accomplish in your business? So you start out with wanting to make sure that any kind of new contact with your business or potential lead is tracked somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so what are the different ways that a new lead can come to you? So we have our lead intake. um, Like I said, we've got uh, the the website would be one. The uh, we've got a couple different, like I said, the joint venture partnership is another. We do uh, cold calling. Um, We do networking. We do mail. Uh, well, and in fact, right now, you know, we're focused on digital marketing and prospecting and networking as our three primary channels. Now, we have done direct mail. We've seen success there, um, but we're recognizing that uh, as right now, you know, the market, we're facing a potential market shift. And and I know with all of the, the COVID-19 stuff happening now, we're seeing a lot of fluctuations in the economy in general, and it's a little bit of a who knows what's going to happen. Uh, but even before that, we were starting to lay the groundwork for that because we recognized that, or at least our opinion was that the market was near the, you know, you can say the peak. You never know exactly when that is, but we figured at the very least we were getting near the top. So we were trying to set the foundation for when the market changed. So to your question about how do leads come in, those, whether we doubled down on the, uh, the prospecting and as opposed to the marketing piece of it, because we wanted to be going out and touching people, right? We want to go out and make the, uh, we're taking that step to get in touch with people as opposed to waiting for them to come to us. So there's your networking piece. Someone's got to capture that. If I, you know, if I or one of my partners talks to somebody and they, they mention a property, where are you going to put it, right? We've got to have a place for that. So that's where it comes into uh, Footpilot. It's very easy to just pop it up, drop the name, the phone number, the property address, and then every single interaction from there on out uh, is captured. And what's really cool with some of the integration things is now even phone calls, both inbound and outbound, if they're recorded, text messages inbound and outbound, you can see the whole trail of activity. Uh, so again, if something comes in, somebody makes a phone call, it pops up there and you've got a method of jumping on that lead to make sure that, or, or if you miss it, you can go back later and make sure that you haven't forgotten it. So when the networking comes in, when our when uh, the cold call, somebody makes a contact there that's, that turns into a lead, we enter that in the database. Um, and then the other ones would be automatic. If somebody calls us, a lead is automatically generated. If a website lead comes in, it's automatically generated. So it's real cool because anytime anything starts, we've got from the very beginning and then all interactions from there. And I continue to encourage my team. You know, you've, everybody's got a cell phone, right? Uh, so it's really easy to pick up the phone and just call the person or call the lead or something like that. The problem there is, you don't have a record of that conversation and you don't always need the recording of the conversation, but sometimes it's good to know, you know, Hey, I reached out to that lead, but you know, Hey, I, w- I didn't get a hold of him or, uh, Hey, we haven't even tried to touch this person in the last two weeks or something like that. Mm-hmm. But if you do everything through the systems that you built, and in our case, again, anytime a call rail call goes in or out, it's recorded and attached to the lead. So now again, I can see when everything comes in through those different channels and I can see the whole process throughout the, you know, that's our audit log, right? And then that way, when somebody picks it up and goes back and says, oh, yeah, you know, Don called this guy last week and then Dean talked to him a couple of days ago. Well, therefore, now I know what's going on. You can listen to the recordings and things like that. So. No, that's awesome. And like, yeah, the, so the, the, the ways typically manual entry into Flippilot for the record with the contact and the property and then like a web lead has a web hook into it. So any, anything coming through your website comes straight into the new um, status in the pipeline. Yep. And then any calls or texts that come in uh, also go into that. If they're new, they've never called in before. Right. Um, we'll come into to flip by it there. Um, one of the pieces with the, the call rail that I love, and I don't know if you guys do it this way, but I used to have to, especially if I was driving, this was a pain in the butt. Like I get a call for a new lead and I'd, I'd be asking them questions and I'd have to find a way to write it down. Right. Right. You know, so with this whole thing coming through call rail, and into flip pilot, you know, the record's going to get created and the recording is right there. So I don't even have to write anything down. I can have my conversation and then later go back, listen and fill out the lead details from the, from the recording. And, yep. uh, and that alone, you know, is just like something that I was like very, very thankful to have, but um, yeah. And the call rail stuff. So are you having your team click on the, the, uh, in the contact on the record to call out from, from the system then. So it goes to yeah. the phone. Yep. And then gets recorded. Yeah. 
Yep. And it's, it's really, you mentioned the web hooks, right? So we have the, the one for the website and I actually have our website generates three types of leads for us, right? So I could have a, um, a seller, right? Somebody, I want to sell my house fast. I need cash. I could have a buyer or an investor, right? Somebody that's interested in uh, getting on our, our buyers list because they want to see the properties that we, we put under contract. And then the third one that we have um, is a retail lead, right? So that when we, for us, retail would be somebody that wants to sell their house at market value or somebody who's looking to buy a house, you know, like you and I may have bought our first house through a real estate agent. Well, that's the same type of thing. Cause again, Dave and Dean are both licensed agents. Mm -hmm. So we can pick up those leads as well. And just, we, we try to monetize anybody that touches the, the system or that, you know, that reaches out to us in any way, shape or form. We try to monetize that lead in one way or the other. So like I said, I've got those three types of leads. And the cool thing is, because I can, you know, when you build those web hooks out, I can associate them to a campaign within Flippilot. So if a, a seller comes in, I know this is a, a cash sale looking to happen or something like that, or, you know, an investment type of an opportunity. So I put that into one campaign. If it's a retail lead coming in, I have a different web hook that catches that one. So I put that in a different mm -hmm. campaign. And then if the buyer comes in, again, a different campaign there, different phone number, it's all associated. So now just even coming right in, I can just look real quick at the campaigns and we in instantly can see what type of leads are coming in and then how that needs to be processed. Because obviously some of them are going to be more urgent than others, right? If you, your, your buyer's list is more of one of those things where you pick it up, Hey, you know, thanks for joining the list. You know, what kind of properties you're looking for? You just got a sense of it that way. The retail lead generally isn't somebody that's looking to buy a house tomorrow, right? And especially right now, you never know. It could be a couple of weeks or even six, eight, 12 months from now. Uh, people, when they want to look and buy or sell their homes traditionally, that's a longer process. But for the investment leads, those are the ones that we, you know, those, if, if that comes in, it's flagged and that has to be jumped on immediately. Yeah, nice, nice. I know I love that. And I haven't even, I, I don't think we've talked that you were doing that. So that's really cool to get. I mean, the system could be used with anything, right? Like you, you're not just using it for, you know, the motivated seller leads, you're using for the, the investor buyers that would buy your wholesale deals and then anybody right. looking to list their property or or buy a property. And then you could set up the follow-up campaigns even on those if you wanted. Yes. For those yep. separately. Yep. So yeah, you, we have are different... you doing any follow-up on those? Yeah, no, we're, we are. And, and you know, the, it, it depend, that's the cool thing too, right? You build out the, the follow-up campaigns, you know, it's a automatic text that goes out an automatic email, or you schedule a phone call to go out. Um, any of those can happen, but depending on the type of lead, again, it's going to be a different sequence. If it's an investor, I'm sorry, if it's, um, well, a buyer lead is a real quick one. I just call them and they want to talk to them and say, hi, how's it going? And then they're on the list. And that's really it until they, we start to engage in a, a transaction. Um, the retail buyers or sellers are typically a lot longer. Sometimes, you know, you get somebody, they're kind of kicking the tires just to see what's out there. Hey, I want to talk to you. Sometimes people interview a couple of real estate agents. Sometimes they don't. Sometimes it's just the one. But a lot of times they're just looking to see what's available. So, and again, if you're familiar with the retail end of uh, real estate, it's a long game, right? It's not something where you talk to somebody today and you're going to have a transaction in, the, in a couple weeks or months. It's usually a six, eight, 12 months cycle because when, when people actually start the looking process, they're really just starting at the beginning. So uh, mm -hmm. that's a longer, that's, we actually have that one's a 12 month follow up, right? Where mm -hmm. the campaign goes every, you know, periodically for a very long time just to kind of keep in touch, see how things are going. And eventually they say, yeah, no, I, I, can we go take a look? Uh, you know, what are you thinking this weekend? Well, boom, now I pop them out of the follow-up and now it becomes a real active lead. Mm. Whereas the other ones, they're a lot shorter cycle because we know somebody has to sell. Usually if it's, if I got to sell fast, then we know how we have to react. And is it a motivated lead? Is it unmotivated? Is there a, you know, a, if a foreclosure is coming, you know, that kind of a thing, we can help them even through the automation. Uh, Cause if we're not there to take a phone call, that's something we have to be aware of, but then we also want to be able to reach out to them uh, and keep them engaged as well. Yeah. And I love how you talked about that, you know, the follow-up could be long-term, especially with those, you know, 12 month drip sequence. And when they come back and say, yeah, ready to do something, you pop them back into being actively worked. And that was one of the assumptions that we had to test with, with flip pilot and doing the pipeline because the pipeline is the main view, right? And it's showing you what you're working. And I was kind of concerned about taking anything that goes into follow-up off of the pipeline. You know, when, when people see that message, when you add it to a follow-up sequence, this is no longer yep. going to appear in your pipeline. That kind of made me feel like, eh, I don't know if people are going to like that, you know, where it's 
it's no longer being actively worked. It's in a follow up. But it sounds like it worked just the way we thought it would, and you like the way that works because then you're really only yeah. focused on things you're actively working. Background yeah. follow up can happen. Doesn't need to be in your face all the time until you want it to be once they reach back out or that follow-up works and they want to do something. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about it from a lead manager's perspective, right? Our lead managers are responsible for that. I mean, they own that whole process, right? And our, our, um, we've got flip pilot set up. So it walks us all the way through from when somebody is a lead to when we have an appointment to when we're in, you know, the closing process, whether it's rehabbing, if we're doing a flip, you know, all the way down. So there's multiple steps and so our lead managers, up until the point where the appointment's been set, they have to keep their eyes on the, the thing. So if you've got hundreds of leads to be sifting through, uh, and you know, Danny, we recently implemented the follow-up. So this is something where I'm, I was able to take a queue that was uh, 175 entries long. And that was just, that, this was a queue that was sort of our old stale leads. Mm. Um, long story, when we got through a conversion process, there was a chunk that kind of fell off the map. So. Uh, what we're doing now is we put together a real short sequence, three text messages over um, seven days, day one, three, and seven, and then 25 a day, we're just putting in that follow-up sequence. So it's a way for us to go through, I mean, think about it. I can either ask somebody to try to get in touch with 175 people, right, which would be a manual phone call. And yes, you can use a power dialer, but for 175, that's not a lot to get through. So that was our answer to that problem was go through 25 a day, go into this follow-up queue and then 25 texts go out. And then that way, when that somebody responds by text, you know, a lot of times we're already getting the, hey, that property was already sold. And, you know, that's when you're like, ah. you know, I knew, <laughs> I knew that was something, but you know, at least we know that we're touching the right people and we're getting through and we're cleaning up the leads. So like I said, that was a way to take 175 and make them go away without any, well, very, very little manual work, right? It's a click, click, click to get it in the, the follow-up queue and then we're done where now our lead managers don't have to worry about thinking, oh, God, I got 175 got to follow up on. Yeah. Instead, they can say what's important today and anything that's in the follow-up queue, I don't even have to think about it, right? Out of sight, out of mind. And now I just look at what's what those critical high import or, you know, high priority leads or anything like that. And I jump on it and that's what I'm working today. Nice, nice. And we're actually going to eliminate some of the time it takes to add it to a follow-up sequence because we're, we're making it to where you can actually have it just automatically use the campaign number that the person came in from. So then you don't even have to choose the phone number if you don't want to. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. yeah. That way it's the, one that less one. Time. Yep. Yeah. We, we have the campaign automatically assigned for that one, but for the other ones I left it blank because yeah, it could be coming in from different phone numbers. And that's one of the things we try real hard to do. If they call us on, you know, phone number one, Every time I contact them, I want to use that same phone number so their caller ID shows up and they know that's us. Right. So yeah. that that's awesome. Yeah. So we and, and also the one-off calls and stuff like that. It should know if if the campaign is there and it has a number for the campaign, it'll put that up as a default in the drop down for the number to use. That way you yeah. don't have to think about it. And then also for the follow-ups, it'll just use that instead of because I think right now, yeah, you can default it to a number, but you know, that you don't know which one. Like right. typically you don't create a drip sequence just for each marketing campaign. It's just right. for whatever they're like following up for an offer or whatever. So I want to talk real quick too about a change that we made in the system. Uh, what a couple of weeks ago and, uh, and the feedback that we got. So we changed some things around <laughs> and uh, we had a zoom call and Don couldn't make the zoom call. And, and so we had made some decisions with the customers about some changes we were going to make to the system. Um, Don wasn't able to, to make that, unfortunately. But uh, when we rolled the changes out, <laughs> I, I, got, uh, I didn't get the email to recently, but Ginger on our support team you know, told me, hey, they're getting some pushback here on the changes. <laughs> and uh, I'm glad I asked her because she didn't want to even give, like, uh, not that she didn't want to give it to me. She didn't give me, she just told me pushback, right? I said, well, what are people saying? Like, send me the actual messages. And then I saw you and your team and I was like, wow, this is passionate. Like, this is a, like, we've, <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've changed something that yeah. they really didn't uh, want to have changed. And so, you know, that, that obviously sparked a phone call and I'm so glad I did. And that's, I think that's why we're on the call here today because, you know, fascinating how you're using the system. I, I think it's, it's great. It's, it's what we were hoping for you know, for people to use it the way we do. And the, the part, I want to talk about that part of what the pushback was, because we, 
we got rid of the addressing inbound calls, mm -hmm. you know, because it was something that some people weren't doing. And so it felt like right. this, this thing that they were dropping the ball on, but they didn't care about it so much, but I think they should care about it, but I can't tell people what to care about, what not to. Right. Do you want to talk about that process and what it does for your business? Yeah, no, absolutely. We, well, you know, we started at the beginning of the call when you asked about leads coming in and having to track them and things like that. It, I, one of the mantras that I've used all the time, and you know, I'm sure successful businesses do the same thing. It's, you know, no lead left behind or anybody that reaches out to us. I want to make sure that we address that, that contact, whether they send us a text message, whether they call us and leave a message, or they might not leave a message, but anytime somebody reaches out to us, I want to have the opportunity to go back and make sure that somebody at least looks at it, right? If it's something that's not, it, it may be a text message that says no. Okay, well, if that's, okay, that's fine, at least, but we knew, or we know that, that we checked and that they, uh, they said no, but it could have been a text that says, hey, you know, I'm, I'm starting to think about it. Well, I don't want to miss that text, right? So, uh, yeah, to your point, what it was, um, the, when a lead would come in, there would be a, a place within the system, there was a checkbox to say, you know, addressed or unaddressed. And, you know, Dan, I'm forgetting what it was before because I like what we've done now. So that's my world. So I'll tell you, right now, when a lead comes in, and I could see how people wouldn't use it because if you have, say, 200 leads come in that day, uh, you got to go check off 200 checkboxes to say that they've been addressed. So somebody may not want to do that. But the way our business is, is um, built is our lead managers go through, and when some, somebody may text you, you know, it may take seven or eight texts to get their message across, right? You know, you send a couple texts and it goes through. Um, well, we're going to have seven checkboxes, but for a lead manager who's working the queue, if they pick somebody up, they start calling that person. It's really easy to just check, 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 check. Now I've addressed this, all the incoming leads or all the incoming communications for this person. Uh, and then it's good to go. And that way we know, even if it's, like I said, a no, because one of our um, campaigns is, is purely a text campaign. So we'll send a text out. And if they, they write back, you know, I'd say what? 19 out of 20 are no, stop, get lost, you know, something like that. But that one out of 20 that says maybe, or I'm thinking about it, or, you know, okay, those are the ones that we want to be able to focus on. So uh, we go and we open it up. This is a no. Okay, check. I mark the lead as, as dead or not a lead. And then I keep going through that way. Uh, what was taken away, when that checkbox went away, um, the piece that, you know, maybe people weren't thinking about was, from a lead manager's perspective, it's kind of like, well, you know, I got to keep checking this thing off. But from a management perspective, that was where it was absolutely critical because what I was doing is uh, every day at the end of the day, I could go through and I would see, all right, here's all the inbound communications. Did we address everything? And they were, you know, more than once when I would find like a text message that somebody missed when I would pull that up, it would be a maybe or a, or a yes or something like that. So um, and, or if it was even somebody who had, uh, it was a, associated with a, an archived lead, right? Somebody we had previously marked as dead, called back or sent a text that said, hey, something changed. And two occasions within the last two weeks that happened, or oh, wow. the two weeks before the, when you had done this. Mm -hmm. So um, when that went away, I wasn't able to go through and see what was addressed or what wasn't. I saw there was a bunch of inbound communications, but I didn't know if somebody had looked at it or missed it or ignored it or anything like that. So that was, I mean, that was the key. It wasn't from the day-to-day -day person who was using it. While they can, it's convenient for them to see what's been done or not, it was from the management perspective to be able to make sure that, A, all those leads were being addressed and to be able to go through and easily, at the end of the day, check to see who had done what. And now, once that came back, it was great because now, the, I told you the other day, when you added the filter, it was like reading my mind. Now I can filter out to just the inbound communications that have not been addressed. So now at the end of the day, there's usually none, but if there's a couple, then either I can take care of it or I can reach out to the lead managers to get that done. But the whole point, like I said, the back at the very beginning, now I have a way of making sure that no lead gets lost and no communication gets missed. And to me, that's absolutely critical. So there you go. There's the passion, right? That's, <laughs> yeah, no, that's I love it. I, yeah, no, but, it's, it's yeah. the, you know, the no lead left behind. And, and what goes the system if you can't make sure that no lead is truly left behind? And a lead meaning, even in this case, a single text message coming from somebody that reached out to you six, eight, nine months ago, or even a year right. ago, or two years ago. Like that text coming in, like knowing that somebody took care of it and that it was associated with that record that came in two years ago. You know, being able to say, hey, 
Like this isn't just a random thing. This is a guy we've been trying to buy this house from for, for two years. Yeah. And, and being able to quickly see all the info from then, right then and there on that property where you were and all that stuff. Um, one thing that, that should help you too is uh, we're getting ready because we're coming out of, of beta. We're still letting people in. People can still get into to flip pilot right now. And, but we're, we're getting ready to, to get it out of beta, which doesn't really mean anything to anybody using it because it's, it's pretty much kind of been out of beta for the most part. Right. Um, right. But just, we, we just haven't changed the website basically to, to not say beta. But um, one thing that after we, we finish some of those touches on it um, that I want to add in that could help too is uh, my friend Don Costa had you know, mentioned a while back about this end of day report that he gets mm -hmm. yep. you know, just from his team. And it's like, I would love to automate that. Just have the system. So that's one thing, a feature we'll be adding a flip pilot end of day report. So you get an email or something that gives you, and, and one of those things could be today's unaddressed inbound comps. Ah, okay. And so then you see right yep. there, okay, you know, you get the email, here's the end of day. Here's how many calls came in, texts came in, all that stuff. Here's how many haven't been addressed as of the time that this report was generated. Right. And that's, then you can kind of see that. Yeah, no, that's awesome. So we are, we do that somewhat manually. We, you know, we, uh, we take a weekly checkpoint, right? At the end of every week, that's our scorecard. Um, and it, uh, I use that term. I'm, I'm the uh, EOS enterprise operating system. There's a book called traction that I, I subscribe I to that model, you know, hands down. So that's, that's how we run our business. And um, there's a scorecard in there. You take a checkpoint every week and it's basically you define your metrics. Mm -hmm. And uh, so our metrics would be, you know, number of leads, uh, you know, number of phone calls made, out, outbound calls, number of inbound calls received, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, but to to have that, uh, right now I depend on every, you know, yes, they got to go back to call really, you can look through the logs and all that stuff, but there's definitely a manual element to it. So to automate that, that would be, that would yeah. be awesome. <laughs> I mean, anything where, again, that's like, that's where I get super excited. Anything I can automate and take off five minutes here, 10 minutes there, an hour there. I mean, that's, that's that much time that you either get back for your life or you can now invest that back in your business doing something of a much higher value. So well, that's yeah, awesome. So if you, yeah, maybe after this call or, or you were going to email me some other stuff too. If you yep. want to just email the stuff that, that we could potentially pull and give you in your end of day report, just let me know with the stuff that you'd like to see to make sure that we have that in that. So, you know, oh, yeah, no, I can add, I'm, I, you know, I'm, you asked me to take a look at, uh, because one of the things I had talked about was outbound webhooks and things like that. So how we could now, because again, integration, or I use, uh, you talk about integration, I use Zapier or Zapier. Mm -hmm. I don't actually know how you pronounce it. I but, don't either. <laughs> I think either way is good. <laughs> but I use that to integrate to, you know, Podio, to, to Trello. That's another one that we use to Asana, which is another one, CallRail, uh, MailChimp, and even Slack, and, and, you know, all these tools that we use. But um, to be able to do that, um, so that would, that allows the outbound communication. So yeah, I'm putting all that. Once you ask me about that, I'm decide, all right, so I'm putting it into a Visio diagram. So I'm actually seeing all of the touch points oh, nice. and in doing so, I know we talked about a week ago about that. I found a couple gaps. So it's one of those things where you, when you rethink your business and you start going through and putting it on paper, you're like, oh, well, you know what, when this happens, we don't have a way of addressing it. So as I'm going through now, I'm actually doing a real thorough thing. So what I'll send you, I'll have all of the inbound outbounds, all the touch points, and I'll have what we're doing now versus um, my little pie in the sky fantasy world. So <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll see, but yeah, I'll I want to try to over time report. eliminate some of those too. I mean, I, yeah. I, I love Slack. We use Slack, especially now, now that we're yep. the whole teams remote now, instead of being in this office. And um, it's funny because I would leave the office to go work at coffee shops a lot of the day yeah. just because I like to work alone. And, um, and then now everybody's out of the office. So now I come to the empty office and work. Right. all day by myself, <laughs> by myself here right. in the office. But um, yeah, so, you know, Slack, Slack is, is great. And, you know, we want to add the ability for notifications to come through Slack as well, not just text and email, you know, for you and your team. Oh, that's so cool. Maybe we can set up channels or something. You have a channel that you hook into it and then have, have any notifications come in through there. But um, what, what was the um, Asana? Are you guys using Asana for, for the rehab project management? Uh, that's my next step. So Asana is just, uh, I mean, it's an application. We use the, the free version. I'm not paying for anything right now. Um, but it basically lets you assemble lists, uh, and you can categorize them. So I have, I use that for our dispositions process. That's our, that's our biggest one. 
um, well, it's, it's onboarding new contractors and dispositions. So when we get a new contractor to, to work on a flip, right? I can't just say, hey, great, let's look at the scope of work and let's get started, right? As great as that would be. Um, there's a setup process that has to happen in the background, which I got to get a, a I-9, W-9, whatever the, the tax form is, I got to get that form filled out. I need to get the payment info set up. So, uh, so we, you know, we use QuickBooks and I can get everything plugged in there, but then I also got to plug them into the our banking software so that I can get them paid because we do direct deposit that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I have to make sure I've got the st- statement of work documented. I make sure all the insurance is documented. So all of these checkpoints, again, it's just a it's a I look at Asana as a big repeatable checklist tool. So I have a template. So when I get a new contractor, I say duplicate this one. It's the template now. I just go through and we make sure we get the contractor set up. But that one's only eight or nine steps. The big one for us is um, dispositions. So as soon as we get to the point where we have a property under contract and we're going to wholesale it, you know, we make the decision at that point in time whether we're going to flip it or wholesale it. If this is one where we want to wholesale it, then I, our, it's good grief. It's got to be 50 some steps that we go through over a period of number of days, right? So when it goes into uh, the dispositions queue under contract, then I go over to Asana and I duplicate the project and it comes up now with a list of, all right, on day one, we go ahead and create, um, uh, what do we create? The, the flyer, there's a flyer that we create. We create a, um, look how I'm drawing a blank here. It, it's a, oh, the MailChimp campaign, right? Mm-hmm. So that, that, that goes out to the buyer's list. And then the third one is we post that to our website where we have the inventory of all of our, you know, our, in, our current inventory. So, but each one of those is a multi-step process. And that's when I actually have our VA do. So I create the project process. And when I do that, it's kind of cool because I can fire off an email automatically. This is one of those Asana things. I mean, uh, Zapier things. The email gets sent off to her, so she gets notified immediately. So she can jump onto Asana. There's the task or the project waiting for her. She can start going through all the tasks that were automatically created because it was a simple copy of a template. And then th- there's day one, day three, day seven, and then day seven we do a price reduction. Uh, if if we still haven't made had a contract by then, and you know, create the flyer, post it to all these different websites or Craigslist or you know, all of that stuff. So that's, that's where we use Asana is for the big, mm. anything that's a big checklist type of a thing that's a repeatable process. So yeah. again, taking all, that used to be me taking two or three hours every time I'd get it done to have to kind of rethink, all right, don't forget to do this. Don't forget to do that. Mm-hmm. And now you've got your checklist and I can now easily assign it too, which is really cool. Yeah. I want to be talking to you a lot about that because I, that's the pieces that I want to be adding to flip pilot is the prospecting piece and the dispositions piece. You know, because I don't, I don't intend it to always just be a lead management. Like I want it to be also the prospecting and the deal part of it too, and not all in the pipeline. Obviously, right. be separate pieces so it doesn't, you know, mix it all up. But um, are you using the checklist uh, for the different statuses in the pipeline? Yes, okay. we are. So every status in the pipeline, I'd say, I think there's only one or two that don't have a checklist, like the new or something like that. But they all have checklists, but like for my my VA, for example, or the the dispositions piece of it, um, that's because it's you know what 50, 60 tasks over three or four days. I want to have it in the pipeline that says you know under contract mar- or marketing for buyer. So and I have two states when it goes under contract, then I create the thing. Then I've got our our transactions coordinator who does. There's a number of steps she does, and that's part of the uh, flip pilot checklist. And then it moves over to the uh, marketing for buyer. But that big list, like I said, which is 50 odd long goes over to our um, VA. Now, if I, if, if I could keep that all in foot pipe, that'd be awesome. So, you know, there's, there's multiple ways to skin the cat, right? Yeah, we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there eventually (laughs) and slowly so that we don't just put a muddle everything up. You know, that's right. Keep it simple is still the mantra of what we want to keep, keep doing. And, you know, just thinking about, you know, the audience listening right now, I think you and I both like to think this way and, and right. have all of these kinds of things happen. But what I love about it is you have processes set up, not just written, but actually in form, in a form with this different software that is being used, right? Because a lot of times in the past, we would write up our processes and our systems mm-hmm. for a business, but they wouldn't get followed because they're in a binder. Like who is, who is doing something right. and opening a binder and, and like following some of this stuff? I mean, it just, it's not very user-friendly, right? It's not a good process. And so setting up all of this so that it just kind of happens and it's all there to remind you and you don't have to hunt for it 
is just a way to have processes and systems that are actually used and followed. Right. And in the second part that I like about that, and the whole reason for, for really setting this stuff up, which, which really isn't all that hard at the end of the day, I don't think, for most of it to, to set up. It's more about what are you going to do inside of it? What are the steps going to be? Yep. But that's a beautiful thing because if you have those documented, they're being followed, um, especially for, for things that are done all the time, you know, like your dispositions you said was, what did you say, like 50 or 70? 50 or 60 steps over the course of, you know, day. and I, it's, it's broken down, right? Update yeah. the title, update the, the, the offer price, update the, uh, the, the photo camp or the link to the photos, you know, so every step, but then that way we don't forget anything. It's not just replicate the campaign. Right. And if you didn't have that with that many steps, I'm sure all the time, 10, 20, 30% of those steps would be forgotten. Right. Something's going to slip more, through. Yeah, right? exactly. Like, and it's right. like, you've right. already determined if we don't do this, we're not optimizing or being as efficient as possible to move this properly. Right. Yeah. So yeah, I love that. You know, it's one of those things too, where you have some of the stuff set up that maybe you don't use that often. And then the most efficient way to do it was forgotten because you don't do it often. And so having, right. having that kind of built in helps you not have that problem. And, and then when you bring somebody new, it's all there already. Yeah. Well, and that was, that was huge. We brought a couple to a couple people on to do lead management for us. And when we recognized, you know, holy cow, none of it was written down anywhere. And, uh, <laughs> you know, so some of it we did have to get, you know, I, I did, I, I built the onboarding process and some of it is, you got to sit down and here, read this because this is, this is what our company is, what we do, how it works, that kind of a thing. But when it comes to the actual use of the tools, it was great because they were able to pick up on it. You know, phone calls are easy working the, the pipeline was easy and there were no, I never got questions about that, right? Because like you said, it's that complex process that's now built into a single, you know, small little box that makes it easy to use. And, you know, the questions were always about all the peripheral stuff or dealing with the customers or the clients or the phone calls as opposed to the actual systems themselves. Oh, wow. So you're saying like using FlipPilot and some of the other stuff, having your team start to use those it was pretty intuitive to where they didn't have, like it wasn't a, a super drawn out process to get them to right. start using it. Right, yeah, no, I loved it. I mean, because awesome. when I used Podio before, I would have to walk everybody through for a first time. And then now when I got a, actually got a lead come in, I'd have to, all right, let's do this again. And then it was a couple, like multiple sit downs mm -hmm. to go through it. And uh, the, the last round, the last person we brought on, it was like, I mean, here's what it is. We walked through it and they said, oh yeah, that's cool. Wait, what? <laughs> so, that's cool. So that's then, cool. And, and once they started using it, there was, I think I got one or two phone calls about it and that was it. So yeah, just jumped right in. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. And that's without all the feature videos being built, which was yeah. you know, something that, that I've been you know putting off because in, in Footpilot 1.0, I spent two weeks, including weekends and I think 10 hour days the whole time creating the hundred plus videos for 1.0. And I, I just, I wanted to die afterwards. <laughs> I was right. just like, this is, I never want to do that ever, ever again. There were just too many features and, and then too many videos. But then when I was done, I thought, well, this is great. So now when people get on onboarded, they come into Flippile 1.0, you know, they've got all these videos. Well, what do people do though when you get software? What I do is I get in, I don't watch videos. Right. You just I use just it. click around yeah. and I use <laughs> yeah. it. And so that was a big yep problem that was a big mistake so when we scrapped that and did 2.0 we said we have to use this without any kind of videos like we have to have this to where they can get in poke around and figure it out for the most part some of the stuff you know like setting up a webhook from a lot of people might be a little bit more tricky but um yeah so and i know we haven't made that many videos so i know you guys couldn't have watched any videos to, to help you right <laughs> Right. We, not too many videos. And like I said, I'm the guy that reads it. So I read all the release notes. Right. right. And so that one, though, to me, those are super helpful because now I know what goes in and what's available. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah. And I started making uh, quick videos for the, for the releases, getting more involved in, you know, cause we do things and we get so uh, caught up in adding features and, and fixing and changing stuff. You know, sometimes that we don't even tell you guys, Hey, we added mentions. And right. Then, and then like, so, yeah. you know, Somebody who asked two months later, when are you guys going to add mentions? We, we added it two months ago. You right. never told us. <laughs> but anyway, so that's, uh, I shouldn't be saying all that. I'm just being honest with, <laughs> you know, but, but we're. When I hit the at sign, it turns blue or pops up. I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's cool. And you can do that in checklist too. That was, um, yep. uh, I think it was Mike Newby, I think wanted that. It was an awesome idea. Um, 
being able to put that on a checklist item to, to mention somebody that that's their thing to do. Um, at the end of this call, this has been, been really cool. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Uh, I, I did want to touch real quick on anything that you guys have noticed or changes that you are having to um, be aware of uh, because of the situation, COVID-19. You know, anything to share with the audience that maybe some things that you've been keeping an eye on or concerns about that other people maybe should you know, consider could happen? Yeah, we, uh, so what are we doing different for, for this? So, I mean, traditionally, the tra traditional process that we work on, and I know some people have done and, and preached the, uh, we, you know, make an offer over the phone kind of a thing, but our, uh, our model is built on actually going to the property walking the property, seeing for our own eyes, you know, what's good, what's bad, what needs to be fixed and being able to create the estimates that way. Um, so now with COVID-19, we have a, in Michigan here, we have a stay at home order that's through, I think it's May 1st, uh, one day past the federal, hopefully I didn't get that wrong. But um, so during that time, we're, we're not supposed to go anywhere and real estate has, you know, deemed a non-essential business. So what we have to do now is our lead managers, uh, when they, they still make the same phone call, same, uh, the process is the same, but now we're actually working into the conversation. Like I, I realized that maybe a lot of things have slowed down and people are nervous about, you know, taking any steps one way or the other, but if this is something that you want to do or have to do, or, you know, something's coming or when this, you know, stay home order is lifted, you're going to have to take action. We're still, uh, we're still buying, we're still selling. So, uh, you know, title is still working. We can still do closings. We actually had a closing yesterday. Uh, they'll either do like a remote notary or um, they'll have the seller come in one hour and then the buyer come in the other hour, you know, so there's no, they minimize the number of interactions. They keep the whole social distancing thing apart and then everything's wiped down with hand sanitizer and all that stuff. Um, but what we've had to do differently is the lead manager is still set an appointment, but that appointment is just another phone call. And you know, as much as I'd want to do a warm transition, you know, handoff to the lead manager from the lead manager to the acquisitions manager, um, you know, people's schedules are, are what they are. And it's, you can't guarantee that you're going to find somebody on the phone. And a lot of times the, the leads are more than happy to just kind of, all right, I've made the decision to have to talk to somebody about it. Now it's going to be a day or two later and that's fine or later this afternoon. But at the end of the call, what we're doing different is we set the appointment and then we ask for sellers to send their photos. So now what we've got is, you know, we had to set up a new email address so then people could send photos in and then we're dropping the photos into a, you know, Google photos cause that doesn't have any storage implications. And then you can send a link and share that and all that stuff. Um, but then this is how, again, when people uh, actually want to go on an appointment, hopefully they'll send us that photo, the photo before the acquisitions manager talks to them because then you can kind of go in and know what you're looking at as though you've already walked the property. If not, it's a two-step process, which is the acquisitions manager has to talk to them and then ask again for the photos and say, look, as much as I'd like to make an offer, uh, yeah, unless I can't see it, yeah, yes, you can make a sight unseen offer, but everything's going to have the contingencies and I want to get as close as I can so I don't come back afterwards and say, hey, I know I made the offer for 50, but now that I see the house, I can only go to 30, you know, something like that. So uh, digital photos, it's, it's a beautiful thing and that's what we've had to incorporate into the process to do differently. But, you know, after that, the, oh, I'll, you know, the one thing now that might be a little different, uh, inspections were considered essential and now, and I haven't seen any, the official, any, but I think that may not be the case anymore. Uh, either that or people just don't want to go into other people's homes. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, that might be a, a hiccup for us and we're, you know, mid-April. So this may be a couple weeks where we can't do that. We were able to keep everything moving despite the lockdown, despite everything else, uh, just using a little bit you know, the methods being a little bit differently, but mm -hmm. uh, I just feel like everything keeps getting constrained, constrained, constrained. And we're, we're still lead generating. We're still setting points. We're still talking to sellers. We may just have to, at this point, if I can't get inspections in, then I'll have to at least write the contract to be, you know, post the, whenever the lockdown is lifted plus two weeks or something like that, you know? So I think as far as how we're handling it differently, that's, that's really about, about it. Cool. No, it's good to hear, and especially because Michigan, Michigan is in, and especially, I'm assuming Detroit probably, you know, being yep. such a bigger city, is having you. Know, you guys have quite a few cases, and so yeah, it's uh, yeah, you know, where it's Wait. where it's pretty extreme, you know. I got an email from somebody in New York who's saying, yeah, I mean, it's just like it, it's really hard to do much of anything, you know, in a yeah. place like that where where we get to like just two hundred thousand plus cases. It's kind of yeah. No, I can't imagine what, well, like, yeah, 
I don't know. Like I said, things are slowing down. It's constricting, but yeah, still as long as we can still move, we'll still move, right? Right. Now it's good to hear. And um, do you guys find? Did you did you try to have you know people put images or, or upload their pictures into a drive folder, or was that too complicated to explain to people? For the moment. You know, I thought about that, some, you know, like a Dropbox thing or something, but um, I, I opted for the, the least impact to the person, you know, they wanted to text it, but CallRail's not real good at receiving photos. Mm -hmm. So um, we had, to, the, the next step was, all right, well, you've got email, right? We'll just send us an email. It's real easy from easy your phone. Yeah. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, so all they do is from their phone attach all the photos to an email and send it, and that's done. So it's nothing really that new for them uh, to to email a photo. So uh, whereas some people to upload to some other drive or something like that, that, that you start to lose. You know, some people have no problem, but other people just they they ah, I'm, I'm done. That's it. So, yeah. Yeah. So uh, the last uh, uh, I interviewed some friends. Um, uh, it'll be a week from when this one is published, the podcast episode, but it was just the other day I talked to them. But they were talking about, you know, getting pictures of, of homes, you know, that were 20 years old, like the pictures, like people were sending. Oh. Photos. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, we haven't seen that one yet, but I can imagine. Yeah, when it was first built, it looked great, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's like, which ones yeah. we send them? Send them the good ones. Send yeah. Them, send yeah. Them brand new. You know, the cars in the driveway are all 20 years older, you know. Right, right. right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this has been great, Don. I really appreciate you being on the show and, and sharing what you're, uh, how you're setting things up and, you know, how you guys are working your business to be efficient and, uh, and, and utilizing Flippilot and, and Lead Propeller and all that kind of stuff. Really do appreciate it. Yeah, no, glad to do it. It's been, uh, it's been fun. Cool. And if anybody out there listening would like to reach out to you, uh, would you mind sharing? Or do you mind sharing if, you know, a way for people to get a hold of you? Oh, yeah. No, that's fine. We uh, Our Facebook page is where we do, you know, kind of engage in the conversation. So that's DDD Home Buyers. Uh, so Facebook.com slash DDD Home Buyers. Three Ds and the Home Buyers. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And if you guys feel like you've got some some great stuff uh, from Don from, from what he shared today, yeah, like leave him a, a positive review on there. That'd be cool. That would be awesome. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, Don. We'll take care. We'll keep in touch. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Danny. Yep.